Welcome back to Refocused. My name is Lindsay Gensel. I am the host and one of the producers of this little show we've been doing for the last, oh gosh, I'll have to count the months. It's been since May of 2022, and I am so excited because throughout the month of February, we are diving into the topic of ADHD and relationships. And here's where I tell you that if you're new here, and this is the first episode of Refocus that you've listened to, while I am so happy you are here, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to press pause and go back. I do think you should go back to the very beginning, but for the time being, you must, and I mean you must at least go back one episode, back to February 6th, and listen to my first episode with Melissa Orloff. She is the founder of ADHDmarriage.com. She's also a marriage consultant and the author of two award-winning books on how ADHD impacts couples, and that February 6th episode kicks off our conversations about relationships this month, and she is sharing her expertise with us throughout the entire month, and I am so excited and so grateful to have her in studio with me today. So thank you, Melissa, for continuing the conversation. It's a conversation I love to have. Well, and there's so much to get to. So I'm so excited to continue our dive into ADHD and its impact on relationships. I feel like this is the time, you know, we did the introduction, we can roll up our sleeves, we can, we dive in and... I'm going to kind of take a step back for a second. So let's pretend I know nothing about ADHD and I come to you. How do you explain what it is? Are you coming to me as part of a couple? Yes. Okay. Um, So I think that one of the interesting things about uh, people back into ADHD in a couple of different ways. One is if they have a child with ADHD and they look at those symptoms and they go, oh, Oh, look at that. <laughs> now, now I get it. This is me too. Um, that's one. But I, I think that um, I, I don't diagnose people, first of all. So I try to provide information and the kinds of things that I would clue people into is, look, does your, are you trying really hard in your relationship? Both of you know that you should be able to do it and you just can't and things keep happening over and over and over again. Uh, you know, you talk about wanting to follow through on things, for example, and then they just don't seem to get followed through on. And, at, or you, you've worked with a therapist who says, okay, now we're going to set a plan and you're going to do, you know, you partner A are going to go do X, Y, and Z in the following time frame, And then it just doesn't happen. And it ha- doesn't happen because you don't really know why it doesn't happen. Um, those are Kind an indicator that ADHD may be present. Um, volatility, emotional volatility, like a quick anger or a quick irrita- irritability, or a lot of escape, um, one partner feeling distracted. There are clues that you can look for that would suggest, hey, maybe you should get an evaluation uh, for ADHD and see if that might be what's going on. And then if it is, uh, there are bazillions of things you can do to start to address it. You mentioned kids and seeing symptoms in children. And most ADHD diagnoses, and I I guess I shouldn't even say most that I know that that's true. I just know from my own experience, I was missed growing up and there were kids that were diagnosed in school. And it's like, everyone's kind of looking for what's happening in the classroom and and behaviors get picked up on because that's what teachers and, and staff are looking for. And so I'm wondering now that we know about the genetic connection between ADHD, do you have more people coming to you who have children who have ADHD? Yes, uh, though I wasn't one of them. I mean, my daughter was diagnosed in third grade. She started to really start to manage it in about fifth grade because things got harder for her. And it wasn't for several number of years until I said to her therapist, is there any possibility that my husband has this? And she's like, well, yeah, of course. It's like, oh, why didn't anybody tell me? So it's one of those things that I, that I try to get out there. Um, But it's not surprising that you didn't get diagnosed, by the way, uh, because girls are often missed. The girls are more likely, when they're younger, to have the distractible version of ADHD, and those symptoms are a lot less obvious than the kid that's popping in and out of their seat and is, you know, beating up people on the playground or whatever they're doing and just very high energy and has the hyperactive side. Those are typically more often boys. And I'm curious, you know, with these, uh, you know, missed signals for women. What do you see then for adult women who have these later in life diagnoses, which we're seeing an influx of right now because of the pandemic? How are we showing up in relationships? Well, I think it's interesting. Undiagnosed adults in general um, show up in a way that's pretty confusing uh, in the relationship. So the first thing that often happens is uh, the hyper-focused courtship 
um, where the extra dopamine that you get. I mean, oh, God. Can you, can you say those words one more time? Hyper-focused Hyper courtship. Yes, okay. That explains so much. And, you know, it is so great to go through that. It is so much fun to be part of that courtship process, right? You are the center of the universe if your partner has ADHD or, you know, you just feel like everything's fit, fitting perfectly. Um, but that's actually a part of infatuation chemically in the brain is about a lot of extra dopamine. And um, for people who have ADHD, it gets them really focused and really intent. I mean, they just laser in on the person that they're in. They're fun. They're energetic. They have lots of great ideas. They're, you know, really attentive. And you think, wow, this is amazing. Um, unfortunately for everybody, whether you have ADHD or not, that extra dopamine wears off somewhere between 20 and 28 months into the relationship. That's just chemically how it works. Um, for people who have ADHD, that means you go back to these lower levels of dopamine. Um, so ADHD is about, in part, extra low levels of dopamine. So you go back to this, you know, the, the person without ADHD goes back to regular dopamine levels and they do their normal thing. The person with ADHD now shows up as a person with ADHD for the first time in the relationship. It's intensely confusing. <laughs> like you're just like, wait, you used to be really attentive, and now you're ignoring me because you're so distracted, but you don't know that. Um, anyway, I digress, but um, <laughs> we were, I think we were talking about uh, something different, which was diagnosis of kids. Is that right? Or Yes. Well, we were talking about, uh, you know, women and how it shows up. And then, ah, yes. and then you said okay. hyper-focus. Uh, say yeah, it one more time. Got, say it. Hyper-focus courtship. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Again, <I> got, <laughs> explains so much. Yeah. And I'm sorry. So I got off, off track there for women. So, so that shows up male, female, whatever. My observation of women who have ADHD is once they find out they have the ADHD, it, it, um, it does a lot to help them figure out, okay, how do I address this? But they face a whole lot of extra pressure that men with ADHD, or different pressures, I should say, than men with ADHD face. Um, a, lot of, a lot more women are responsible for managing things around the household. This is just statistically, again, not ADHD or not ADHD. This is how our society works. Um, and those things tend to be boring. They tend to be never-ending. They tend to not have a particular structure to them. Uh, and all of those things are not strengths for people who have ADHD. So there's all, uh, and there are these expectations that it's going to be easy, you know, and that they'll remember to go pick people up at the right time and all of that. And, and so there's this huge um, uh, pressure on women with ADHD who are sometimes doing both jobs, often doing both a job and this. It's a lot to juggle, and they often really struggle. My observation is that women address it and try to really work hard at it much faster than many men do. That's a generalization because there's also a group of women who say, yeah, no, I'm going to go off and play tennis. Thanks. <laughs> See you later. I'm not really going to take care of those kids or do that other stuff. Um, but I but I see a lot of really um, engaging even before they know about the ADHD with the struggles that they have. And like many adults with ADHD, there's a lot of shame involved. And one of the horrible um, statistics that I've heard not too long ago there's a research study that was done on um, critiquing and ADHD, and that children who have ADHD um, experience 20,000 additional critiques by the age of 12 than people who don't. And so people with ADHD grow up with a well of embarrassment, shame, I'm not sure I'm good enough, all of these feelings inside of them um, that they have to deal with they carry them around all the time. They deal with them every day. Um, and so that, um, that plays a role for, for women um, with ADHD. Um, there are some experts in that particular field. Um, Sari Solden is one of them. Um, Kathleen Nadeau is another one where they try to really hone in on the special issues that women face who have ADHD. I have to laugh when you say these things because it's one of those things where I can feel myself start to get emotional because it... it <laughs> I think when you've gone through life and you don't know what it is and you don't know why the way you feel is happening and, and it's so overwhelming and then to have somebody just explain it and explain why things happen and why you feel the way you do and it's like, 
oh, you just kind of have to laugh because it otherwise is so sad. Yeah, it is. Well, and I also have to say, so when we're, while we're talking about women with ADHD, one of the things that breaks my heart is when <clears throat> I'm working with a couple and the husband who works outside the home comes home to a woman, these are heterosexual couples, but comes home to a woman who is taking care of four or five kids and, and you know the house is kind of messy and there's a ton going on and says, what have you been doing all day? Why isn't dinner on the table? And, and I'm sorry, you know, I'm, you're supposed to stay very neutral, but I really want to throttle the guy at that point. <laughs> I'm just like, really? Do you have any idea how hard it is to take care of children? You know, and they, there is a, a um, you have to be, uh, to make that efficient and get dinner on the table at six or whatever it is, you have to be quite organized. And that does not fit well with uh, the ADHD stuff. On the other hand, um, many positive things as well. But uh, that particular one is one of my pet peeves when I hear that one. And it does come out with some regularity. And I find myself saying, look, the hardest thing you could ever do is help take care of kids at home and manage kids and help them grow up to be healthy individuals, particularly since several of them are going to have ADHD and they may be emotionally dysregulated or have school issues or whatever. It's just a huge challenge. Please don't diss your partner this way, you know. Words matter and the way things are phrased and understanding and empathy are huge parts of, you know, one, just being a good human being. But I, while we're on this, I want to touch on women and this idea of like the biological clock. And so, you know, I'm, I'm coming from personal experience here. You know, I was diagnosed right before I turned 35. I have always been so career focused. That is where my ADHD just comes out. There's so much that I want to do, even to this day. Like, it doesn't matter what tier I make it to. I'm always looking ahead. I'm always looking for that next shiny object. And I think for a lot of women, children become this kind of, you know, you mentioned it. If we go by stereotypical cultural norms, societal norms, the woman is the one who stays home. The woman is the one who, you know, does the majority of the child taking care of, you know, like we, how many hours a day does a, a mother breastfeed a newborn? You know, so that sort of thing in my head gets very overwhelming. Like, am I willing to give up my goals and my dreams to be a parent? And I'm curious what you've seen working with women who have been diagnosed with ADHD and, and how that fits into it. Because I don't think it's necessarily that I don't want to be a mom, but I also know that I'm up against this clock that I really have no control over. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, it's, excuse my language, but it's like, you've got to figure out if you want to like do it or not. Yeah. And I think there's an added element, not just the biological clock, but I think there's also this question of, wow, I'm kind of disorganized. Am I going <laughs> to actually be able to manage this? Yes. And I have to tell you, it's actually a really good question to ask. Um, and it's not that I'm trying to discourage people no. from having kids. I Just the opposite. You know, my kids are wonderful and amazing, and I'm so glad I have them. But uh, there, it's a very real question. Couples almost always really start to struggle after they've introduced the kid, into uh, the first kid, into the relationship, unless they have really planned for it. Uh, and maybe that's a topic for a new book. I don't know. But, um, but uh, the, the number of tasks that are boring and hard to keep track of and never ending um, and the 24-7 nature of having a newborn in the house plus lack of sleep, which makes ADHD symptoms much more severe, um, really hit couples like a two-by-four to the head. They have no idea that it was going to be that hard. Um, and it puts a lot of strain on the relationship. So it's not just about careers. It's also about people wondering, hmm, should, should I actually be doing this or, or, or struggling with it once they do? Um, and there are things that can be done to make that a lot better. First of all, prepare for it. Figure out how to get the structures in place that allow you to do boring things, um, even when it's hard to do it, and allow you to stay coordinated around what needs to happen in the household, like a weekly meeting or something like that which isn't about delegation, but which is about coordination and equal status between the partners in that. Um, and also, um, there's a lot of research that talks about creating f what, what creates the healthiest families, which includes the, in a heterosexual couple, the female 
or woman inviting the man in to be a full participant in the caretaking. And with breastfeeding and other kinds of things, that actually takes uh, intentionality. Um, and so preparing along those lines can really help diminish some of the issues that couples would face. So there's that. But then there's also just the, hey, I'm really into this. I really like it. I'm going to follow what my life, feel, what feels good in my life. Um, and, and then there's that issue. I mean, I, many of the younger couples that I know have a conversation around, I'm not sure, the well, women in particular, I'm not sure if I want to have kids. I'm not sure uh, whether that's part of what is going to make my life really feel, you know, lit up. I think with a lot of things with ADHD, I have one day where I'm like, oh gosh, yes, kids. And then you go to the grocery store the next day and you see like a mom having, you know, four kids and they're all melting down and you're like, nah, I'm good, you know? (laughs) It's, it's very much like the ADHD brain. And now that I've gotten my consulting here out of the way, you know, I'll go back to the script and and go back to kind of the path that I thought we were going to go down. And then, of course, I (laughs) went on the the ADHD. I think I took you sideways anyway. (laughs) I just – sometimes it's so nice to hear that you're not alone in that. And I think, you know, you can go back to, like, your childhood as a woman, like how early a baby doll got thrust into your hands, and that was just kind of the thought process. We were always just told that that was – what life had in store for us, and then you kind of realize that it can not be in the plans. And yeah. everyone's lives are different, and whether you're choosing to not be a parent for whatever reason, you know, it's it. You just have to be the one who's making that decision. Yeah, and I think that our. I'm happy to say I think our society uh, is moving in a direction where people get to make more of their own choices, and it's not just predetermined hey, you're going to be in a heterosexual relationship. Hey, you're going to have kids. Hey, you know, all those things. We're actually able to look at our own, who we are, and, and pick more of what we want. So I'm, that, I think, is a wonderful thing. And it is hard. I mean, you know, when you have kids, your life changes, period. Nobody who's had kids would say anything else. And there are wonderful things about it. And then there are sometimes when you're just like, oh, my gosh, what did I do? No matter how much you love your kids. So, Well, I want to touch on the ADHD effect. It's something that you define in your book. And I'm curious, so it's essentially, it's exploring what happens in a marriage when one partner has ADHD and the other does not. And so what does that look like? And and how do you, you know, start that conversation with a couple? So most of the people who find me find me because they're in a state of great struggle. So um, they're really looking for any help they can possibly get. And I have to say, there was a point in time when the, one of the top search terms for finding my website was, why does my wife hate me? Oh. <laughs> Which is horrible. <laughs> but it's also sort of uh, descriptive of why, you know, how people get to this place. And happily, it's no longer the, one in the top part. But um, I think... Uh, there's just, first of all, usually it's, at least with, for me, there's a partner who's really struggling more and is that just out seeking answers. And so finding the information is a relief. People say to me, I read your book and it made me cry. And, and okay, I, you know, as much as I don't like the idea of making people cry, they're crying from relief because they see themselves in the pages and in the stories and, and also in the potential solutions. They have been hopeless and they suddenly go, okay, there's a little glimmer of hope out there. Maybe if I pursue this, and and that's um, that's what it is. So, so there's this process of of um, getting going and and learning. And as I said, the very first step is finding out as much as you can about ADHD and how it impacts relationships. And there are, as I said, there are these patterns that I mean, if people say, how do I convince my partner that this is an issue? And I say, go to the patterns chapter of the ADHD effect on marriage, pick a couple patterns, one that is general to your relationship and seems really familiar, one that reflects poorly on you, (laughs) because we're all human, Yes. Uh, and read them out loud, a couple of paragraphs to your partner. Hey, listen to this. This sounds so familiar. And a lot of times, that's all it takes. It's just a, oh, this sort of aha, huh, that's really interesting. And then after that, get delving into the stories really helps convey, hey, there's something going on here. I'm curious, and I'm asking, so I'll, I'll use my partner and I as an example. He'll love that I'm just kind of throwing him into this. <laughs> 
So he's the neurotypical, very organized, very, you know, A to Z. I am the exact opposite. I will get to Z, but how I got there is yet to be determined by anyone, you know, I just, yes, yes. And, and <laughs> if I've done the task once before, it's not necessarily going to happen the same way the second time. Right. Drives them crazy. When we fight or we have issues and we are in couples therapy and I, therapy is a gift. Yeah. I am so relieved that I opened myself up to it. Having that person to go to who is impartial has just been it's a it's a privilege to have the time and the resources to go, and I totally understand that. But I'm wondering, so you've got me, who is the ADHD person, and then you've got my partner, John, who is the neurotypical. And I'm wondering when you see a couple, is it typically the ADHD person who is seeking out help? Is it typically the non-ADHD person? Because I have to imagine, you know, I look back at our relationship and when things were tough or things were hard and I wanted to run, my frustration was that he wanted to me to be somebody that I couldn't be. Mm -hmm. And on the same side, his frustration is that I couldn't be somebody that he needed me to be. <laughs> and so it, it, I imagine it's kind of, you know, it goes both ways. But I'm curious what you see when, you know, couples come in if there's something that jumps out. Yeah, I, I think bull, it, you know, either partner might be looking. It's the one who's the most distressed and the most tuned into the distress. Um, and so lots of times when it's, uh, and there may be a gender factor, lots of times women who are kind of like, you know, I'm kind of relationship oriented. I think I want to work on my relationship and actually do something to try to work to fix it. Um, the women will approach, particularly non-ADHD women who are completely mystified about what's going on, um, particularly if they don't know for sure that ADHD is out there. Um, I also see a fair number of ADHD partners who are at a point where their relationship is about, they're about to get separated or something. So the, the hammer has come down and they're uh, completely panicked. Grasping at straws. Well, yeah, I just panicked. You know, what can I do? What can I do? It's sort of the deadline version of relationships, right? <laughs> um, and so they're out uh, looking for things and saying it may be too late, but you know, what it, can I do? Give the college me some all nighter. They're pulling the college all nighter exactly. to save their relationship. Exactly. So that's sort of I see both of those with some regularity and all variations. Um, beyond that, I also see a, a surprising number actually now of younger couples who've been aware of the ADHD, who are struggling a little bit and who want to get um, advice or counseling before they get married or very early on in their relationship. Um, I started another uh, another series of support groups recently, and I have one support group where three of the people in out of nine, so a third of them, um, are either not yet married or married in under three years. So as more information gets out, people are, are doing this earlier and earlier, which is great because once you've been doing these patterns for 30 years, really hard to break the habits and the fears, the anxiety of, oh yeah, it's always gonna be this way or this is the way it's always been um, and, um, and, and make changes. It feels like something somebody who has ADHD could also dive into before they're even dating someone. Mm -hmm. Because well. that, so that's my <laughs> no, and, but that's my next question is because I look back and and I'm going to ask you to say it again and it's not because I like hearing it the hyper focus courtship yes that thing the hyper focus courtship <laughs> it literally explains every single one of my relationships including the one I'm in now and I just so happened to find somebody who was honest and kind and we had to have a very difficult conversation very early on in our relationship as I was love bombing him from left and left and right where he said, I really am enjoying spending time with you, but you like me right now more than I like you. And that doesn't mean that I'm not going to get there, but I just need to be honest with you. And he said it probably in a nicer way than that. You know, I, I cried and slept on the couch. It was very dramatic. <laughs> but I have to tell you, that was the first time I'd been told that by anyone, that he was honest. Yeah, his transparency was great. Yeah. I remember actually when my ex and I were first dating, um, you know, I had dated people once a week, twice a week, whatever. And then he came on the scene and he was like four or five times a week. I'm going, wait, time out, <laughs> time out. <laughs> this is like way too much. I mean, he quickly won me over because he was 
the attention was so gratifying and so exciting, and he was all in almost immediately. Um, and, and a funny story, this is, this is just him. I'm not saying this is – he had a list on his refrigerator of women that he had met in a, like a two-week period. He had lunch and dinner every day of the week to try to meet people. Um, I'm actually his second wife, so he was recovering from – um, his first wife leaving him, and and, um, <laughs> and so, and I, and then when he met me, then he just like ripped it up, <laughs> and that was that. He was like all in. Uh, that's that hyper focus, um, and it's pretty intense, but it's also lovely. But I can imagine that it leads to the hyper focus courtship leads to people getting into unhealthy relationships. It leads to people getting into relationships too fast. Okay, they get in before that dopamine wears off. It's very common to have people get married within a year or a year and a half of meeting that person. And you're smiling, so I don't know what your time frame was. but Not married, uh, but there was one weekend when the twins were playing the Yankees and there was a very cute boy from Canada, and my friends were very concerned that I was going to have like a shotgun wedding. And <laughs> honestly, there were, there were points where I was like, I mean, why not? And real grateful that didn't happen. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, and, and then when that, you know, the, the hyper-focused courtship tends to wear off abruptly. I sort of remember there was like one week, very soon after we returned from our honeymoon, where suddenly everything was different. And I'm just looking around the room going, huh? Wait, what? Wait, oh, was this just like, now that I'm married, uh, you don't care? I mean, there were all these uh, gender things that came into it as well. Like, you know, but, and people sometimes say, oh, it was cut, it was, uh, what's the expression? Uh, you know, fish and I don't know, but where, where, where you really, you know, they put a lot of stuff out there and then once they got you and reeled you in, they didn't care anymore. That's not what's happening. Not at all. This is not intentional. Um, but anyway, it's, it's very abrupt. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, or if I went off on a tangent, but. Well, no. And you, you mentioned people get into relationships too fast mm -hmm. and how do we slow that down? Somebody who has ADHD, who's out there, who's, who's dating, who's, feeling that hyper-focus courtship, who's loving that feeling, because we know we get the dopamine rush from other places. It, yeah. can, it doesn't have to be a relationship. It can be food. You, you know, it can be shopping. Our relationships with whatever the dopamine rush is, is what's kind of holding us back. So, I mean, this is another uh, cry for awareness. If you know this is a thing, as it's happening, then you can address it differently. And you can talk with your partner about it. And the partner who may not have ADHD can say, okay, as great as this feels, I get that this could be an issue. Let's slow things down. Let's not get really partnered up for a couple of years. Just make sure that everything's going to be copacetic. Um, so you could do it. If you don't know about it, you're not going to slow it down because it's great. And everything feels wonderful. So it's really an awareness issue. One quick thing I want to ask about is high stakes and relationships mm -hmm. and divorce rates. And I'm wondering, you know, do we even know enough right now about where things stand with divorce rates and ADHD and, and how it fits in there? Especially because what, what was this? What was the statistic that you said about how many adults are undiagnosed? About 80% of adults with ADHD don't know they have it. And so, like, how does that play out? So let's say you, you know, you're with your partner, you are starting a divorce, you, maybe you then find out you have ADHD. Like, it, it just feels like a lot to take on. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. So, you know... Um, the, the statistics, the research, there's not a ton of research in this area, interestingly. And um, divorce rates are based upon what cohort you're in. Highly educated people have one divorce rate. People who uh, get, you know, knew each other from high school, got married really young, have a different divorce rate. So it sort of depends upon what cohort you're in in terms of what your rate of divorce is. The research that exists that I have seen suggests that the divorce rate is actually no different for couples with ADHD in the early stages. Um, but that as they stay together, there's an increasing rate of, of marital problems and, and divorce. So that by the time you're hitting your 50s, um, you're, you're more likely to be divorced than, than average. Um, and that there are often multiple relationships um, with people who've had ADHD. Um, so, so it's an issue. Um, and then you had the rest of the question, which was? 
I don't even remember at this point. <laughs> I'm going to have to start taking notes here well, when you ask me a question so I can go back to it. <laughs> well, how does retirement play into that? So retirement is a different thing um, because the people, the cohort that are in retirement right now are the least likely to know that they have ADHD because it wasn't being diagnosed with, back when they were in school. Um, and so uh, they've had those symptoms for their entire life. Uh, and they've been stomping around in the relationship, and the relationship has probably got a lot of bad patterns in it or may well have a lot of bad patterns in it. The, the rate of relationships where there's uh, diagnosable dysfunction by the time you hit middle age is about 60% of relationships with ADHD, so it's high. Um, so the other thing that happens is if you're a woman with ADHD, um, when you go through menopause um, and the estrogen levels drop, estrogen is directly related to the production of dopamine. So women, unfortunately, um, get worse symptoms as they Woo! age. Yes. Aren't Another you looking thing to forward, look forward to, that? to? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that plays a role, and it's confusing, and people don't know, well, is this just regular aging, or is this, you know, what is this? And if they don't know about the ADHD, it could be kind of scary. So there are different ways to address that. Um, Sometimes you run into issues where somebody retires and um, doesn't know what to do with themselves because they haven't. That's not just about ADHD. Um, but I hear sometimes terror of like, my partner's really disorganized. They're all over the place. And now they're going to be home all the time. Ah. <laughs> um, and then I hear the opposite. I just heard this the other day, actually, which is finally my partner has the time to be able to do what they want to do and and uh, and also be able to contribute around the house uh, more. And so now my partner's cooking, now my partner's doing the shopping and stuff, really happy to be doing it and has the time to do it. And it doesn't matter if it takes twice as long for the partner to do it because there's no time constraints. So it really depends on the couple in terms of, of, of how it manifests. And we haven't touched really on same-sex couples mm -hmm. and and – Obviously, my partner and I fall into the heterosexual category, and so there's kind of all of these societal norms that are pushed at us that we've been, you know, dealing with since birth. And so how does a same-sex couple navigate kind of the ADHD effect when they're kind of figuring out their own path and, and who's taking on what because, you know, they didn't have it set for them? So that's interesting that you asked that. Um, and I think the couples that I've worked with who are same, same gender couples, um, the women, one of the benefits that the women have, and I don't think this is specific to ADHD, is they tend to have better communication skills uh, with each other. So both partners often have quite good communication skills, and so they're able to talk more openly to work through their issues, which is a real plus. As far as the ADHD symptoms go, you still run into the same kinds of patterns if you have a, a ADHD and non-ADHD partner. Um, but there tends to be uh, less of the sort of societal inequalities of expectations that somehow the woman is going to have to, you know, in a heterosexual couple, the woman is going to have to do X and the man is going to have to do Y. There's a lot more conversation around what's fair, what's not fair, how do they want to be together, um, what kinds of, of um, negotiations can they do. Um, with the uh, gay couples that I have seen, there are other issues that come into the sort of gay society and how gay couples function and et cetera. Again, you still see the same kinds of issues around uh, more organized, less organized, what's fair. But again, not the assumptions of the heterosexual world about um, assumed inequality. You don't have that, you, you, but you still do have, you know, you might have one partner, for example, who's much more into being a free spirit and the other partner who's much more into being organized or staying on top of things or whatever, that's a similar pattern to what you see in a heterosexual couple. But there's a gay twist to it in terms of how do you deal with it, again, without the um, heterosexual social expectations. Let's talk really quick about dating because whether you are – dating in your teens or your 20s or you're divorced and getting back out there and you have this ADHD diagnosis and you kind of know what you're bringing to the table, how does that change who comes into the relationship? And I say who because I know there's Lindsay before I was diagnosed and now there's Lindsay after I was diagnosed and they're two very different people and at the same time very similar. And I, I 
hope, knock on wood, that I don't ever have to go back into the dating pool because oh, <laughs> online dating just sounds I, – I just feel for people. I like – talk about – an issue for people with ADHD, and then yeah. you give somebody a database of basically window shopping. Yeah. <laughs> I got to imagine that it's just like, it, it's it's sometimes probably brutal. It's really an interesting, it's, it is, it's like candy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, it is, it can be, you get hyper-focused into it, but it is also, dating is also an area of great rejection. So when you are in the online dating communities in particular, there's a lot of rejection, even if it's swiping, you know, it's a huge amount of rejection. And that is really triggering for people who have ADHD. So it's a real, uh, you know, area of landmines um, for people. Uh, and th there's another part also, which is the timeliness expectations around online dating. You're supposed to respond within a certain number of hours. You're supposed to respond in a certain way. You have to remember how you're supposed to be able – you have to keep people separate. I mean, uh, there's a lot of organizational stuff that goes on. Um, I know uh, when my daughter was dating, she's like, I hate online dating, Mom. I hate it because I'm expected to respond within a certain amount of time, and I'm doing other stuff. Um, and, you know, that's just one, uh, one issue. So it's, uh, yeah, that, that's really hard. Um, and then there's the impulsivity that comes with ADHD where you sort of, you know, impulsively jump into a relationship, which might or might not be well considered. There's, you have to, it's hard to get to know somebody and people just like on social media in general are putting their best foot forward or, um, I like to laugh about online dating cause I'm, I'm doing some of it myself now. Uh, it, it, you know, the stories are so similar. How do you tell them apart? I mean, these people are not similar. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting place to be for dating. Yeah. How do you, you know, actually communicate who you are as a human mm -hmm. on a website with photos and, you know, I just, yeah, I don't well, I there's don't this, ever want to be there. And there's this other question, um, which that I get a lot, which is when do I tell a partner that I've started to date about the ADHD? Um, oh, gosh, I didn't even think about that. I yeah. mean, I'm, but I'm also just such an open book that <laughs> I just come to the table. It's like tattooed across my forehead. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think this is actually a bigger issue for older people who are dating because yeah. younger people are more attuned to just, just sort of picking it up and not really thinking about it that much. Um, and, and my response to that is when it's appropriate within that relationship, you certainly don't have to say, hey, I've got ADD, you know. Uh, but on the other hand, at some point it is relevant because there are things that you have that are strong and things that you have that are not as strong in who you are, like everybody. Um, but some of these are related to symptoms and, and maybe that's useful. A, a hilarious story, actually, um, and I, now I may embarrass him, but a family member uh, came to me, now a family member came to me and said, so I'm starting to date this person in the family who has ADHD, and so I thought I'd go out and look it up and see what happens, and I came across you. <laughs> <laughs> That is awesome. It was awesome. And I just said to him, you know, well, okay, you have a resource, but I would promise not to butt in. And uh, But, it, you know, there is information out there now. Uh, there wasn't right. uh, before. And so, anyway. That's hysterical. Yeah, it was a fun, it was really a funny moment. You're like, so what did you think? No, what, no, I no. didn't say that. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel badly because I'm kind of everywhere, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, I didn't want to be, um, you know, feel like that was scary. It's yeah. kind of a the I feel like the, a movie's been made about this before, right? I think that there's there's got to be a movie out there already with this <laughs> this plot line, just or there not, could be. Yeah, it just hasn't yeah hasn't been done yet. Well, I'm so excited to continue our conversations. If you are just tuning in, this is refocused. I have Melissa Orlov. She's joining us for the entire month of February. We've got two episodes under our belt. The next episode next week, we are going to dive into emotions. And I'm really excited to touch on rejection sensitive dysphoria. You touched on rejection a little bit with dating, but I'm really curious to, to talk about how it can you know manifest in a relationship, especially with somebody with ADHD. It's something that when I learned those three letters, like the, the four letters ADHD, learning those four, game changer in my life. When I learned what RSD, rejection sensitive dysphoria was, it, it really put 
so much into perspective. And so I'm so excited to dive into that. That'll be coming up next week on Refocused. You can listen to this podcast wherever you are listening now. Make sure you subscribe and you'll get notified when episode three with Melissa Orlov is ready for you to listen to. And you can check out all of the wonderful things that we have going on by going online at Lindsay Gensel and at Refocus Pod. You can email us right now at podcast at ADHDonline.com. And a quick recap, although I'm sure by now you already know and love the work that Melissa is doing. She is the founder of ADHDmarriage.com. If you have not checked out her website yet, I highly, highly recommend going over there. And I specifically want to point you to the couples seminars that she does. They happen about two to three times a year. They're live via Zoom. And they also are available in the self-study version. So you can head over to her website. Again, that's ADHDmarriage.com. And you can check that out. It has been kind of a lifeline for couples who have been impacted by ADHD. And what I think is so important and what she has touched on in these last two episodes is that they are great for people in relationships wherever you are. As you mentioned, you've got people who are dating, people who are in the first couple of years of marriage, and people who uh, have probably been married for a very, very long time. And growth is wonderful and it's so important, so make sure that you go and check that out. Refocused is produced and hosted by me, Lindsay Gensel. Our production team includes Al Chaplin, Sarah Gelbard, Sarah Platinitis, and Phil Rodeman. And support also comes from Keith Boswell, Claudia Gotti, Melanie Mile, and Suzanne Spruitt, and the entire team at ADHD Online. Our show's music was created by Louis Inglis, a songwriter and composer based out of Perth, Australia, who was diagnosed with ADHD in 2020 at the age of 39. To work with Louis, and I highly recommend if you're looking for music, you check him out. You can find his email as well as links to his work shared in our show notes. And to connect with the show or with me, you can find us online at Refocus Pod as well as at Lindsay Gensel.